Hey everybody, it's Peter Diamandis, and welcome to the next edition of Exponential Wisdom. I'm here with my dear friend, Dan Sullivan. Dan, mm -hmm. how you doing, pal? I'm doing really well, and... It's gonna be an exciting, cutting subject here today, huh? It is. You know, I just want to say something, that there was a kind of a watershed moment, and I was watching television uh, about three months ago, and... There was a commercial on because it's the beginning of the tax season. It was from H and R Block, and their commercial said H and R Block plus Watson, <laughs> and Watson is the AI super AI from IBM, and the leader of that project at Watson actually addressed our second. I think it was our second Abundance three hundred and sixty. Then I went digging for articles about H&R Block because this is a century old, essentially an accounting firm that turned to tax service, really long in the tooth. And I said, what an incredible way to reposition your company just by adding Plus Watson to the commercial. And I thought it was a watershed moment because I hadn't seen any popular advertising where somebody said we're in partnership with an artificial intelligence platform. <laughs> well, to clue our listeners and viewers into what we're talking about here on this podcast, I want to talk about the ability of AI, given an explosion in the amount of data, to actually make predictions far better than humans. And, and just mm -hmm. to so remind people about this concept of an explosion of data. You've perhaps heard me speak about what Cisco's predictions are for the Internet of Things or Internet of Everything, that by 2020, we're going to have 50 billion connected devices, a trillion sensors, and these sensors are your Alexa at home listening to your conversations or what you search for on Google Now or on Siri. And the data also is the explosion in the social graph of what you tweet, what you retweet, what you forward, what you watch on Facebook, what you post on Instagram. All of these things are data points. And I remember the election, the 2016 election. I mean, who doesn't? There were two entities predicting Trump was going to win against the odds. One of those entities was an AI by the name of Dan Sullivan. <laughs> uh, uh, and I remember being in your home and having a drink and you're saying, nope, he's going to win. He's not even close. And I'm like, Dan, come on. There's no way in the world he's going to win. The other was an AI out of India called Moog AI that evaluated some 20 million data points on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of these social networks, and looked at who was saying what and who was forwarding what and who was commenting on what. And I guess they didn't care what the pollsters were saying. So what do you make of all this, Dan? You know, this came out days after the election that the Trump campaign was crunching data. You know, with, uh, I suspect, AI, they were crunching data and they weren't paying attention to normal polls where people are called and what's your opinion on this and this. They weren't contacting people at all. They were simply analyzing social media traffic. They were assigning emotional impact to uh, messages and all the em most emotional messages for a candidate were the ones for Trump and it was like an eight to one ratio of social media. There's a White House advisor today who is with Breitbart News, Steve Bannon, and he was a co-founder of a company in Boston. I think it's called Cambridge Mathematica. And they had hit on this method also. So they had this internal take on social media, and it gives you a much greater sense of momentum in one direction or another and what the enthusiasm is, you know, the intensity of support the velocity versus just static snapshots. Yeah. Well, people lie to pollsters, I guess. <laughs> well, they did in this case because there was a real negative response in many, many circles if you gave your actual opinion. And just three things. I mean, that was the first time I've ever been called AI. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to take more seriously, intelligence or artificial here. But, <laughs> but anyway, I've been in a political campaign since I was a kid. 
I've been on the inside of seven major political campaigns, and there's a number of factors. One is turnout on Election Day is a big factor. The other one is just the enthusiasm for the candidate. And so there were three data points that I picked to make my projections. And one of them is I'm from Ohio, and Ohio is historically is the most strategically important state. As Ohio goes, generally the country goes. Since 1803, only twice has Ohio not voted with the winner in the presidential campaign. And it's a composite of the country. Ohio is a very composite state, big state, you know, it's 13 million. And Trump immediately went up five points after the nomination. It was probably the only important state that he immediately went up, and he never came down. And I said, that's one of my data points. The other one is I go to Cape Cod every year to a little town called Wellfleet. Babs and I generally vote Republican, you know, and I Goldwater was my first campaign in 1964, so that kind of gives you an indication of where I'm going. I always say it's a historic day when we arrive in Wellfleet, which is a town of about 3,500 people. On that day, the Republican population goes up to two. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, so what? I love the place. I love, you know, I love the seaside. I love the restaurants, and they're, they're good people. But one of the things I always do is check bumper stickers. And I went to the main parking area in Wellfleet. There were about 60 cars there. And, you know, when Obama ran in 08 and 12, I mean, every bumper sticker had Obama-Biden on it. So I checked out the bumper stickers. This is before the election. And there were still a lot of Obama-Biden. And then there was Elizabeth Warren and there was Bernie Sanders. And in the entire parking lot, there wasn't one Hillary Clinton bumper sticker. I said, they're not going to get out the vote. There's no voter enthusiasm here. Mm. And the other one was a limousine driver in Chicago, a woman who says she's the first licensed female limousine driver in Chicago. And I get in the car and she turns around. And she says, what do you think is going to happen on November 8th? You know, and I says, oh. I don't know about November 8th, but I said, I think on November 9th, a lot of the people who think they're the smartest people in the world are going to have a really bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, well, so do I. And she says, you know, half the people, and you know, this is fairly upscale clientele. She says, half the people who come in and say, well, at home, I say I'm going to vote for Hillary, but when I go into the booth, I'm going to vote for Trump. And I said, people are lying to the pollsters. Yeah. So those were just three data points that I put together. So it's going to be, you know, I think about this and I'm very clear that AI is going to actually be able to see not what people say, but what people's actions are. Yeah. And you're going to see their actions way in advance. So the 2020 elections are going to be even much more interesting, right? Yeah. And I think the other side will be clued into this. I think this blindsided the Democrats. They were relying on fairly conventional. Yeah, I think the Democrats are just going to get, you know, sort of China and France to help push the election in their direction against the right. No, just kidding. Uh. But it's going to be an interesting year because we're also going to have AI trying to influence us as voters. Yes. Right. And AI who knows I have to, by then, eight-year-olds and that they're interested in robots or space and personalized ads, knowing where you are, what you do. So it's going to be Interesting. So AI's ability to predict things better than pollsters. Yeah. But the other interesting conversation, pal, that we had recently was that AI is also done extraordinarily well in predicting sporting events mm -hmm. against the odds. Mm -hmm. This one AI called Unanimous that runs a program called UNU, you were doing a bit of research on this, and they've made some amazing predictions that have turned out correct. Yeah. One which kind of boggles the imagination is the prediction of which teams would actually be in the playoffs. At the end of the baseball season, there's two leagues, there's three teams. There's actually four teams in each who qualify. There's three division winners, and then there's a wild card. 
and they predicted the survivors to the round where you had six teams. And I mean, it's just phenomenal, the odds against knowing this. And then they actually predicted who the final two were, which was with the Cubs and uh, Cleveland Indians, my favorite team, and I've suffered enormously for my loyalty there. (laughs) And the other thing, they predicted it would be a seven-game series, and they also predicted that Chicago would probably be down three to one at one point and would come back and win the final three games. I mean, this is eerie. If humans were doing this and not databated, you'd have a major congressional investigation uh, yeah. you know, into the betting industry. I mean, everybody on those clubs would be doing urine tests for the next six months to uh, see what happened there. And I think Unanimous also predicted the superfecta. Yeah, the first four to finish in the Kentucky Derby, the top four horses, I mean, which Again, the odds are so extraordinarily guess that. And they predicted the comeback win of the Super Bowl for the New England Patriots, but also predicted the final score. That's insane. Yeah, it is insane. So you know? I honestly will have to see. They're making predictions again for this coming year. And what are they predicting in baseball this coming year, Dan? The Cubs will repeat as world champions. Again, there are so many factors that can go wrong. Ordinarily, you know, a star pitcher or two or three players getting injured. In a short series, when you get into the playoffs, you get a hot team. They can knock off a really good team. I mean, Cleveland, deservedly, I mean, in the condition they were, they were badly injured. And for them to predict that this team with injured two of their pitchers out and everything would get to the finals and then take it to a seventh game. You know, I don't know what to think about it, Peter, because it's so foreign to the first 72 years of my life have been. There have been humans who are better at predicting things than others. Yeah, there's a whole class of what's called super forecasters Yeah, that do a very good, get in a lot of data, and then are able to make predictions. But predictions of this accuracy, fidelity, and detail seems almost, it is unbelievable. So we'll see whether the Cubs do it again. And you know what's even more miraculous than any of that? is anybody who knows me who hears me speaking about sports. (laughs) (laughs) I don't do sports. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) but I have to tell you, you know, that headquarters for Unanimous, they've got to have amazing, amazing security around that because tips from them with this track record can almost produce the result that they're predicting, you know. so And I bet the police and the FBI and everybody are looking at them, not at them particularly, but... Is there any possibility that what the platform is predicting, that information can get out and hit the betting markets? Fascinating, right? So you know that as an Abundance 360 member, I do a monthly webinar with a CEO and we focus in. So we're actually approached the AI company Anonymous who's making these predictions to do a webinar that we'll probably do in May or June with them. And so hopefully you'll be on it so you can ask those questions because the impact of AI on financial markets is huge. Yeah. We're going to see AI hedge funds and we're going to see AI stock trading. Well, listen, over like 70, 80% of all stock trades right now are black box AIs trading at super high velocities. Mm-hmm. But in the sporting business, I wonder how it's going to impact Las Vegas and the odds and so forth. Like you say, I think it's going to be a, incredibly impactful and and will it actually shut it down in the final result yeah i mean one of the things here i mean you sent me this whole series of articles and my mind went through a flip and i said well we just jumped into an entirely different domain of what's happening here because humans have to have an entirely new relationship with an entity that used to be in a mythical realm you know the gods know or sorcerers know and everything else, but these are machines in very cooled rooms that are punching out data. And the other thing is, what's the input to these machines that's doing this? And one of the things I found very interesting from the campaign was the son-in-law, Kushner, who got great kudos, by the way, by Eric Schmidt, who actually did a lot of the data gathering Obama, from yeah. Google, who was on the on the other side. But one of the things they discovered was that people's favorite television could be 
lined up with the issues that were most important to them. The one that I found really, really interesting was that disproportionately, the people who watched The Walking Dead were very, very concerned and worried about immigration. Okay. I have no idea where to... You have this invasion of zombies, and, you know, it's just the associative connection between what they're watching on television and what they're seeing in the news, what they're perceiving as a key issue. NCIS, they found that there was a very close correlation between their interest in NCIS, any one of the NCIS franchises, whether it's L.A. or Washington or New Orleans, they noticed that national security was a really big issue with these people. So, I mean, I'm just putting those out. They probably had millions of other data points, but those were ones that I just found interesting. It's measuring what people's actions are. They're flipping the channel and they're watching this or not watching something else. So with sensors, as you say, the explosion of sensors, human activity is going to be picked up in myriads of ways that point towards certain kinds of outcomes. You know, it's interesting, for those who are science fiction fans, Isaac Asimov's The Foundation series did a lot of this sort of large computational mm. predictions over multi-generations and things were, were predictable. I have to go read that again. The Mule. Yeah. <laughs> so it's fascinating. And you know, the other thing, I mean, since you brought up the Foundation series, we have to talk about the laws of robotics. Isaac Asimov's Three Laws, yes. Yeah, Three Laws, because if they get super smart and then they've got muscle to go along with them, we're going to have to get some law and order established here. Or we need more muscle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to figure out very soon, people keep on asking me, Peter, what's the difference between advanced AI and humans? And I say, we'll find out yeah. if an AI can be as funny as the best comedian, if an AI can be as artistic as the best artist, if an AI can be as loving as the most loving human, these are, we're going to actually determine what being human really means by virtue of yeah. what the difference between, you know, massive AI computation is and human. So, well, here's just a historical context for that. There's no question since large scale machinery came into humans' lives, which starts at the end of the 1700s and grows very rapidly. I mean, the difference in life between 1720 and 1920 is like a planetary jump because of industrialization. And there's no question that humans have become more humane as large machinery came into their lives and large industrial processes, that we were able, with the need for using our muscles to get all the work done, to have large machines do a lot of the work, we became more humane. Society is far more humane today. Steven Pinker talks about this, how we've become more peaceful and we've become more humane since that. That was my exact conclusion. As we know of the relationship between humans and AI, I think the knowledge about who we are as humans is actually going to expand enormously. Yep. Yeah. You know, just as you were speaking about the move to the early industrial revolution, which was water powered and then steam powered and then ultimately petrochemical powered, that when we make jumps in energy sources, it transforms the planet. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking if you're up for it in our next podcast, I'd like to talk about the jump we're in the midst of right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing that I loved about, you had a blog on this, because it's been a recent blog on the A360 network, but you came up with three exponentials that are converging. And I think it's always useful to tell people what the plane factors are when you're predicting something. And you did a wonderful job in that blog. <laughs> so I think yeah. Should we talk about energy and what's going on in the transformation of the global energy economy right now? And I think that's yeah. moving faster. Yeah. So many countries are dependent upon an energy economy for making money. Mm -hmm. It's going to have an impact on global superpowers and economics and uplifting humanity. So if you're good with that, maybe we'll, yep. we'll do that next yep. time. Let's go for it. All right. Anyway, good to see you, Dan. I can't wait to see 2020, what predictions AI is going to make and and for Major League Baseball, uh, Chicago coming back again. And man, oh man, when we bring on Unanimous for a A360 webinar, 
please join me so we can ask the hard questions to those guys and find out how we put some big bets down before <laughs> before the odds change. Good. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks, Peter.